Redman Group today, co-founder of the Redman Group and CEO of 21 Studios. Today is episode 81 of the Redman Group, and it's going to be starring and focusing on special guest Pat Stebman. We also have new panelists on the show today, Ken Curry. He was a workshop speaker at the 21 Convention Patriarch Edition this past spring in Florida. He uh, was introduced to me by Dr. Shanti Smith, and he's worked closely at times with Dr. Robert Glover as well. And he was actually on the Redman Group, one of the three episodes we filmed live there in Florida that you'll see later uh, published on the YouTube channel, probably in the next couple of weeks. Also, of course, today with me, regular panelists, Steve the Dean Williams from themanmindset.com and DDJ from Miss Andrew Today on YouTube and MissAndrewToday.com. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. It's good to yeah, be here. Good thanks for having me on, Anthony. Thanks. Yeah, I'm just not realizing I moved my camera, so I should move my mic. <laughs> so, so in today's episode, guys, what I wanna focus on is the red pill itself, as well as Pat Stedman, and how his work differs from that, agrees with it, contrasts it, all these things. Uh, Right out of the gate, I just got to say that, you know, one of the Red Pill icons for years has been Rolo Tomasi, of course, you know, from Red Pill Community, author of The Rational Mail, former co-founder of this company. And his number one hatred of anyone I've ever seen is definitely Pat Stepman. <laughs> uh, th this was obvious. This is not like a hidden thing. Anybody who had been watching this community for years or months would see this. So it's interesting to have him on the show and to hear what he has to say. Many of our speakers like Hunter Drew, Alexander Cortez and more have recommended me to get in contact with Pat for a long time, to talk to him and hear him out. And today that's what we're gonna do. So I'm excited to dive into that and uh, see what comes up from that conversation. So Pat, can you give, uh, other than the brief introduction I just gave you, can you give our audience kind of a quick intro to what you do and what your work's about before we get into anything else? So I do dating and relationship coaching for men. Um, I, I've been sort of in this community for about 11 years now. Uh, got involved with it back in 2008, and that's all obviously been a really long journey. Uh, you know, very much in the pickup in the beginning, moved a little bit more into some more authentic types of games as time went on, and then moved into even kind of like explored a little bit of like the sort of hippie spirituality circle, and then I found myself in the red pills. So, uh, okay. if I can kind of now like where I am now, uh, which is obviously a little bit different. If I could kind of describe, I mean, uh, my path has taken me in this direction because I'm always just trying to search for truth. And so I went from being just like a guy who didn't, like, like many guys, right, didn't understand anything about women at all. And it's just kind of been this onion I've been peeling the layers back of. So uh, you mentioned Rolo, and, and I came into this community. I mean, I, like a lot of people, I came to it because of the po political situation, right? But you okay. get pulled into other stuff as well. And... You know, Rollo had a really big following and he was saying stuff and people really felt a lot of certainty around it. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested because it was very different material than, I mean, it definitely had some references to pick up, but it was much more like talking about the core aspects of women. It was less tactical and it was interesting to me. And so I, I listened to his material, um, you know, because I was at this point, I was just kind of coming out of like the like the spirituality stuff. And I knew that that was the hit or the hippie kind of, you know, SoCal, I call it the SoCal spirituality community. Um, yep. And I wasn't finding that, that to be a complete answer. So this was really cool because it was explaining things from a different angle and I couldn't deny certain truths in it. But I also didn't feel like it was a monolithic understanding of women it didn't square with my experience. It didn't square with other strains of thought. Mm. And so, I was trying to find that reconciliation. So like, in what sense is this material true? What context and are there contexts when it's not? And so that was the dialogue that I was first trying to have with Rolo. I was trying to, you know, I, I didn't find some of the stuff he was saying to be completely well rational. Um, and I was That's trying to add, I was trying to add a little <laughs> bit of, of nuance to it. And his response was, very hostile and he this was back that, in the that summer of, familiar yeah all right so this was back in the summer of 2017 and okay. there's a whole series of blog posts on my blog that kind of outline this this conversation so to speak um but i think that the core thing was that i thought that he described women who are on a very who are on an unhealthy or kind of like immature or lower level, I thought he described their behavior extremely well. And 
I've but, seen you describe it actually as uh, the red pill is useful as in understanding the shadow side of women. Yes. The darker elements, yeah. And I, 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 later in the show, maybe I'd like you to explore a little bit more on that and what that means uh, more detail. For sure, happy to do, do so. Um, but yeah, so, so you know, he talks a lot about the feminine imperative and it felt very much like oh. this was basically that everything in humanity was like the entire history of man has been this like fight against women trying to control men and conquer men. And I didn't think that that really squared with reality. And so I published something called, you know, the ultimate imperative. And it was really about men and women in their own different biological imperatives and how it comes together. And, and we didn't like that in our, and things soured, um, so to speak, the spats got more and more personal. Yeah. Um, but whenever we'd I, argue, I remember you know, when this was going on on Twitter. It was always like this big clusterfuck. Yeah. So. And I'll, I'll give I'll give myself a little bit of credit. At this time, no one was really doing that to him, which is I think is why he hated me so much now because I was really like I was causing a lot of shit around him that he wasn't used to. Because I think in it was like after the election, that corner of the internet, you know, and, and you know, Mike Cernovich kind of like moved away from. Manosphere stuff. So there was a vacuum that was created. And I think Rolo really filled that vacuum. And he had like maybe six months or so. Of Rush just had like also left the Red Pill community, I think, right around this time hmm. and started doing his neo masculinity. He tried to hive off and create his own community himself. I don't think it ended up working out, but he still has a huge audience. That's, that's actually, that's right. Yeah. So there was a lot of things in, in this, and a lot of people kind of moving on and it created a big vacuum. And Rolo really took it, took it up. And anyway, so. Um, we would argue online and frankly, I think I made him look like an idiot. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. And so he blocked me eventually and then he's, but there's always been stuff that continued from then. So we've always had like a, yeah. you know, some low scale war going on. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I remember just watching these go, I would always just stay out of it. I'm like, I don't really, sometimes I'll get involved with stuff, but usually I just didn't, I was like, yeah, I don't want to be part of this. These are our own battles. He could do what he, do what he needs to do. Yeah, I, just, I know behind the scenes though for years that uh, a lot of our speakers have been rooting for you. They've been talking to me about you. Guys like Tanner Guzzi, guys like AJ yeah. Cortez, Hunter Drew, and these guys. And yeah, it was it's you know nice to find. We've been talking now, you know, over text and DM for a little while. And so it's good to finally get you on the show. It's great to be here. And those are those are really good guys. So I mean, I'm yeah. I'm happy it seems like everything's been been cleared, you know, who's on yeah. where who's who's where, <laughs> right? Yeah. Sometimes things take time to, you know, heal and to mend or to action to be well, taken. Well, if I can jump in here too, I can kind of speak to that. I'm I'm no stranger to controversy, and what I find is is that you know usually what ends up happening is is that you know a lie travels halfway around the world before the truth gets its first airing. And what ends up happening in a lot of these situations is is that a lot of people really don't care about supporting the manosphere or you know the red pill community per se. And so what ends up happening is is they develop these cults of personality, and then once they have their little cult in place they'll do everything they can to protect it with no regard to the ethics and no regard to, you know, what kind of responsibility they have as a voice within the manosphere. So, I mean, and, and, and really the reality is at the end of the day, and the last thing I'll say is this, is that the truth always comes out. And so when it does, um, you know, then everybody gets together like we are today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's get into some uh, topics here. So we can go through the panel with this as well. So I know Pat, you sent me some notes we can go through and I do want to go through those. But even before that, just some basics. What do you think about intimacy in relation to the red pill? Intimacy for men and how they deal with it, and how they uh, evolve with this over time, how they develop it and interact with it in their lives. Is this something you've seen embraced in the red pill? Is this something that you've seen rejected? And I mean, in my opinion, it's a hot button issue that you know a lot of guys don't want to deal with. Well, it, can go, it can go south real quick, being too vulnerable, too intimate, oversharing. There's, there's definitely issues with it, in my opinion, but a lot of yeah. value in it, too. There are, and I think that, so one of the, th one of the things that I've kind of tried to understand a bit more over the last two months, which is sort of, it was like a crystallization of a lot of the stuff that I had had as like issues with, with Rolo and whatnot, and trying to figure out like, where is the truth in this entire spectrum? It's from what I understand now, you have people who are basically on different levels of, I don't mean this in like, it's, it's not a judgmental way, but there are different levels of, of consciousness and they're in a different relationship like between like a higher vibration or a lower vibration. You can kind of feel if you go into a room, like some people might might say some of this stuff sounds a little woo-woo, 
Sure. But I mean, on a most, on a more basic level, like, you know, if you're around someone and they have a negative vibe and you're just like, I don't really want to be around this person. Right. This could, also have, be, this could also be interpreted as like who's present and in the moment and who's like stuck in their head and shit like that. Would that be? It's, 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 it's part of it, but it's also just like, it's an orient. It's like, how are they oriented towards other people? So it's, so people who are sort of on a lower level, they're, there, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of helplessness, a lot of scarcity, a lot of obsession with power and control. Mm -hmm. Whereas as you go up the spectrum more, there's more courage. There's more love. Oh yeah. I've there's seen you write, um, I think tears you have like a, you had a blog post about this. I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, so as people rise through that, that spectrum, their orientation towards the world changes. They seek less control because they expect good things to happen to them. There's more abundance and, you know, it, look, I mean, I, it works. It's, it's accurate in my experience. Maybe some people don't, it may take them some time to understand it in, in full, full blow, but there are ways that like, there are different kind of markets, right? So everyone talks about the sexual marketplace and the sexual marketplace exists, but there are also different dating markets within it. And you can kind of segment it in terms of you have a, like a low consciousness dating market. And so if you're going to be as a guy <clears throat> focused on power, right? You want to be the guy who's in control in the relationship, then the red pill is the correct answer to that. Because and and what a lot of the red pill guys seem to understand and it's it's correct, they look at feminism, um especially its later forms as being a movement to put women in control of men. It's a it's, huge power grab is what it is. Like a it, huge, yeah. It is, it's a power grab. And so the red pills response to that is that, no, no, we're gonna take the power back again. And it's like, well, okay, like, and, and so that's why a lot of guys are like, well, is the red pill really our enemy? And it's like, well, I, I kind of look at them, like I, I understand some of the points and I can get into some of the, the relevant details about the good parts about it, right? Mm -hmm. But the framework, that men and women are against each other, like the only people who benefit from that are actually other feminists, hmm. right? Like, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like if you, if they feed off of each other because it becomes like a victim perpetrator dynamic, no one's having loving relationships. And so if everybody is like out to get each other, then yeah, you wanna know the best ways to do that. And you're gonna use an insecure woman's insecurity against her, you're gonna, and, and. That'll work. It'll work, it'll it's work. Like, I was saying recently, you could throw gasoline on daddy issues, like this fire. Oh yeah, oh my God. <laughs> and it works, like, it, there's, it, a reason, there's a reason we talk about it, and there's a reason that guys have thought this up and executed on these ideas. But, hey, but can the I, question. Can I, Pat, can I say something with that real quick? Absolutely. Sure. This whole absolutely. thing about, you're talking about the power grab and everything. And, and I like to really think about the whole power thing on two different categories. One is you're talking about when it's a power grab, it's a power, which is the whole thing of the zero sum game where somebody mm -hmm. has power, the other person has no power. And, and you got to start, we, as men, we have to start thinking a totally different game with power where I call it abundance power, where I become powerful and then my woman becomes powerful. And then as she becomes more powerful, I become more powerful. And there's plenty of power to go around and thinking where it's not a zero sum uh, plus one minus one equals zero. Then you start thinking about power, how it really is. And, and then everybody wins and it's pretty damn awesome. Yeah, and I, was, I, was thinking, I was thinking about that too. Like uh, you're putting it like, I like the way you're putting it, that if you, there's so much power on one side, it's like this domineering force. Yeah. Which, which and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, which is different from like leadership and authority and responsibility and respect and things like that, which are also forms of power. And these things should be, yeah. Well, I, I, so, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Sorry. No, so, so I was just going to say, like the man, the man leads the relationship, but mm -hmm. just like, like if you're like an infantry captain, right. And you've got a platoon, like there are different ways to lead. Like you can lead because, Hey, I'm an authority. I lead. Like you got to follow what I say or that, and which is usually pretty empty. You have to like rely on the sergeant to do things. You'll get fragged, right? If you do that stuff. Um, leaders who lead based on truth though, they lead from like the position of, we're going to take this group to another level. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to 
protect you, right? I'm doing what's best for you. So in, in a certain sense, it's like, it, there is a degree of leadership from, from service, but it's really like you're, you are so grounded. Your frame is so strong and your authority is so strong because it's not even about you. Mm -hmm. It's about a higher order truth. Mm -hmm. And I think that the problem for a lot of guys is that they don't, they, they have a hard time even looking beyond, like looking to that level. By, by higher order, you mean like alignment with your nature as a man, like through evolution and biology and psychology? Or is it, you're talking about it a little more different than that too? Well, it's, it's definitely that because you have okay. to be aligned as a man. I think as a man, if you're, if you're not in touch with your masculine aspect, you, you actually can't do this. You won't mm -hmm. be able to, there's certain phases as a man you have to go through. And once you get your masculinity really understood and, and grounded in you, you start to, you can start to kind of take it like, you know, you, how do I put it? I mean, I talk about it like, it's like you are discerning what is true in a certain situation. What is, what is true? What is best? What is best for her? What is best mm -hmm. for you? And you're leading off of that. So mm -hmm. it, it's not about you. I, people talk about this as, as like leadership in terms of like a service-based leadership, but I think that guys might misconstrue because they think, oh, you're just trying to do things for the girl. It's like yeah. th that, is, that is submitting yourself to her ego, which is like mm -hmm. back in that game. Like we're not talking about it. Obviously, we fall into ego. We're humans, right? But the idea behind it is that you're trying to lead the relationship from a different place, from beyond mm -hmm. that stuff. And I really want to emphasize this. Like – you can't operate in a relationship at this level if you are not willing to leave a relationship. Because yeah. the, the trap that guys get into is like, I don't have a choice, I have to be in this. And then they're weak, and then you can't lead from weakness. Yeah, so, you have no, you have no you're, you're reducing yourself to zero options at that point when you don't. Yeah, yeah. so you wanna choose to be in a relationship because if you are 90, 90% in a relationship, it is way harder than being 100% in a relationship. Huh. But so you would you would disagree, and we can open this up to the panel. You would disagree. It sounds like strongly with the idea that for one sexual strategy, for one uh, one gender sexual strategy to succeed, to succeed, the other one has to fail or be compromised in some significant way. This is something that Rolla said a thousand times, and I've seen elsewhere in the Red Pill as well. Because that to me sounds like the zero sum game where mm -hmm. someone always loses. I mean, if you want to just distill things down to a purely biological level. Men, both men are both. Uh, you could argue that men have the best and the worst. And I, I think Roy ba Baumeister. This is another really good good uh, mm -hmm. book, by the way, for guys um, yeah, is. reading. Is there anything good about men? Mm -hmm. um, way before it's time for these kind of conversations, and he got a lot of flack from that. But he's one of the best psychologists in the in the nation in the world, really. Um, and he talks about how men are on both sides of the bell curve with all sorts of stuff. So. <laughs> Everyone talks about like guys are at the very top, you know, highest level IQ, highest, highest earning. And that stuff is true. And there's biological reasons for that. Um, and then we're also at the bottom. We end up in yeah, prison. That's right. They go in a prison. They have the lowest IQ. They have the, so it's, it's like, but no, society ignores the second half of it. Yeah. Right. But the idea behind it is that guys who are on the very half, you know, in a, in a purely evolutionary sense, right, theoretically, the guy could spread his genes throughout the population more, right? So you can say that women have an uh, advantage against men who, who didn't really, you know, because the idea is that men are expendable. Like, I, I love giving this example. Mm -hmm. There is... Um, the war is a very obscure fact, but it's interesting. The War of the Triple Alliance, this was a war in the late 1800s between Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, supported by United Kingdom against Paraguay. So Paraguay at one point was like, it was bigger, much bigger, and it was wanted sea access basically. And so there was a, there was a war about it. None of the other countries wanted that to happen. And as you can imagine, a tiny country like Paraguay against you know, two mm -hmm. massive countries, another country, and supported by the United Kingdom, didn't go over very well. Uh, Paraguay was is actually lucky to exist. I mean, it was like negotiated by, I think a US president negotiated the peace treaty that kept it in existence. Doesn't matter. The point is that Paraguay lost, I think, nine out of the 10 men in the country. Mm. Wow. Like, <clears throat> I, I haven't even heard, you go to World War II, all the stuff that happened to the 
to the Russians, right? It's, it's worse than that. And yet, and, and there's even dispensations given for men to have up to 13 wives for a generation because there were so many women compared to men. The population rebounded in a generation. Mm. So it really underlines the point that men are expendable. It's one of, the, one of the reasons that men are put in the front line because the society can use, lose a lot of men and it can rebound. Can't do that if the women are taken away, basically. So anyway, I want to make that di digression because that is the role of men. Like That's why men have this impulse to prove themselves and to grow and to become more powerful, right? Because if a man doesn't do that, a, man, a man's existence on a biological level is determined in a large sense by what he does. Women, women can also define themselves in these ways, but on a biological level, that's not as relevant. So for so, men, that would be consistent with the idea that you are what you do, not what you think, or you correct. are more of what you do and not what you think. Correct. Correct. Okay. And so when we talk about the sexual strategy thing, it's like, well, well, yeah, women, they don't want the guys that didn't prove themselves. They, they don't, they don't want that. They're biologically oriented to not want that. But for the guys that have proved themselves, they really want that. And so we talk about this, like, so just biologically speaking, right? Like, it's not that women are out to go after men. It's that, like, women, women maybe oppress. They don't grant sexual access to guys who didn't, who didn't compete. But they don't do that to other guys. And you don't have to be, like, some freaking Chad. Like, the, the, one of the, or, or, or let, me, let me rephrase that. You don't have to be, like, this massive player. Like this is another thing I find so funny is that a lot of the guys over there, and I have no problem with that. I, I you know, I, I think that guys today, there's a lot of, there's paths you can take. And I think that there's also, sometimes you have to go through certain experiences to, to grow. Um, but you, you see stuff with like, uh, like this idea that the apex alpha man is just like out hooking up with tons and tons of girls. It's like, that has never been historically accurate. That has never, like, the guys who did that always suffered problems socially from other guys and because they were a risk to the community, basically. So it's, there's a lot of, like, pseudoscience that gets, that gets thrown around. So I, that was a long-winded way of me basically saying that it, it's, it's not one-dimensional that, like, women are out to oppress men. Women, in many ways, and in a good relationship, you really feel this. Like women actually want their men to be better mm -hmm. because it's better for them mm -hmm. to have that happen. How dare you speak that? That sounds like <laughs> red pill treason. Well, here's the thing. It, it, Pat hits the nail on the head. Okay. And, and I've said this a lot in my content as well. And that is, is that um, women are not out to oppress men. I, I've always said this, you know, and that's why people, when, when you hear feminists reframe the conversation of opposition to feminism as an opposition to women, that is, that is probably one of the most disingenuous reframes in that particular dialogue. And, and the reality is, is that feminism is an ideology and there are many, many women out there who do not subscribe to the feminist ideology. Now, I'm I'm going to say this that you know hypergamy is a biological imperative and that does is what causes men to compete. But once you have a balance in your relationship and there's a mutual respect and a mutual investment, then those relationships are are possible. So I think that you know there's there's a lot to be said when it comes to that, but I think the most important piece at least for me anyway, the takeaway is this is you know, don't let anybody tell you that you know this is a war of men and you know against women it's not it's it's a feminist war on men and feminism is an ideology it's not a gender so mm -hmm. don't don't let any anytime somebody reframes or tries to reframe this idea that feminism you know opposition to feminism is an opposition to women that that's bullshit plain and simple yeah and feminism has a lot of men involved with it too the vichy males that uh, yeah. they're using it for all kinds of reasons they think are going to help them or whatever the whatever they've been brainwashed with it's easy to forget that too, because of the, you know, at least by the name, feminism, but there's a ton of men involved with it. Celebrities down to your everyday dude and support it, wearing t-shirts and shit. Yeah, but let's not make that a segue to talk about Vichy males. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So Pat, let's get into some of the notes you gave me and we'll go through these in the panel. You guys hop in and in and out as you like. So some of the notes that uh, Pat wanted to go over with me, I'd love to get into. Uh, Red Pill's hyper-rationalist foundation which is based on a flawed premise of human nature. 
considers man to be an animal, which backwards rationalizes and justifies unethical victim perpetrator dynamics between men and women. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Maybe the relationship between reason, rationality, and instinct in men? Sure. So, and I'll come right out of the gate and say this is something I've struggled with uh, leveraging rationality, being rational, even when it might uh, superficially feel or look like irrationality. Like it's an impulsive thing, right? Tapping into that side of myself. Can you, can you ex ex uh, go into that a little bit more, Anthony? Yeah, sure. So, being, I think, for example, being aggressive and being assertive with women is tapping into a non rational side of your brain. It's being impulsive and being okay with that and embracing it rather than freezing up with it, having a fight, flight, fun, you know, freeze response uh, or something else like that. And this is something a lot of guys struggle with, especially if they're raised like beta, blue pill, do not have a strong father figure around, someone to lead by example and present like how that works in real life in a positive and healthy way. And I learned how to do this uh, in part by just going out, you know, and meeting thousands of women through cold approaches and stuff like that, in my, especially in my days in the pickup artist community. Uh, so I think that's, that it took a long time. Like the red pill is supposed to be about truth and reality and all these things. And therefore, rationality is a method, the best method to obtaining that. But that doesn't always mean you're going to be uh, what most would consider rational in the moment. You might appear to be very irrational in the moment, but it's mm. not. This is what women are going to respond to. Cool. So, so yeah, I, I, know, I, jump I, know, I don't know if I'm explaining this perfectly. No, no, that was really good. That was really okay. good. That, that <laughs> helped give me a little bit of a, a little bit of clarity. So you can kind of look at it like you have sort of three centers. You have your, your gut, you have your mind and you have your heart. Okay. And as a man, you like a lot of guys today, they're completely dis disconnected from their instinct, but they're also disconnected from their heart. They're pretty mm -hmm. much just mind. And you see that a lot with like, you know, a lot of bitter people online, um, they just, you know, they, they have theories about women, right? And, and they use it mentally to rationalize why certain things in their life are the way they are. And, mm -hmm. and the mind is also where, you know, a lot of, where a lot of uh, ideological thinking comes from. Guys who go out and they start to challenge themselves, like, like you did, Anthony, and they go out and they mm -hmm. approach a lot of women. So long as they're, they're really like, they start to feel it in the moment, right? Mm -hmm. They get really in touch with their instinct. And the instinct is a very attractive place to be when yeah. interacting with a woman because women respond to men who have their instinct. This is very important, especially in the bedroom. A lot yeah. of guys do not have any sort of connection with their, their animal nature. Ken and I were talking a bit about mm -hmm. this um, before on the call, and that would be, you know, love to have you jump in and talk a little bit about that afterwards, Ken, based on some of the other things you were saying. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, now I would argue that there's another part too, which a lot of guys also struggle with. And I think that the people sort of in, you know, the Tomasi circles just are com have completely shut down. And that's the heart center, right? And that's the ability to sort of feel, feel something for another person. It's, it's basically allowing access to love. Now, the problem for them is, is for, for a lot of these guys, at least, I won't generalize everybody, but they got hurt. And so they never had a really good relationship with that part of them. Um, it was always very needy and it would just kind of flail out and they didn't, they weren't in touch with it. They weren't really in touch with love so much as need, but to the extent that it was open, that's how it expressed itself. And then to they clarify, got hurt. To clarify too, the Ripple community, in my opinion, is notorious for guys finding it after a toxic relationship. Yes. That's mm -hmm. how I was introduced right. to it and like a huge chunk of that community, that's how it was formed. And that's different from the like MGTOW community. Well, maybe not MGTOW, but that'd be different from the pickup artist community, which is a little more diverse in the, how people find it. And obviously like the men's rights community too. Mm -hmm. um, that can be part of it, but it's more, the reasons people find those communities are more diverse in my opinion. It's a really good point. And I think that a lot of the PUA guys are trying to develop more instinct, mm -hmm. usually when they're going out with it. Um, and. I think that the, some of the other communities with red pill, there's maybe more focus on like the mind aspect of things. Um, mm -hmm. And other ones are more concerned with the heart. And I think that if you can combine all three together, you have a really good way of living. But if you leave out one, that's, a, that's gonna be a real problem. Like the problem, so for instance, I, I told you a little bit about my story going through these different um, you know, communities over time and I think it's that's actually kind of an interesting way to look at it. 
because one of the things with like, you know, SoCal spirituality community, like very, very open heart, um, very, yeah. very not. Just by the name, it sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, well, it's, it's, community. well it's, it's a descendant of the new age community. It's, mm -hmm. you know. It is. <clears throat> yeah, it is. Very not in touch with their mind for the most mm -hmm. part. Um, and with middling aspects when it comes to instinct. Uh, so yeah, so, but for a lot of these guys, it's like they, they actually, so their hearts shut down completely after being hurt and they really leaned on, on theory and they leaned on power and they leaned on these sort of things. And that, that, that became a crutch and they're, they're so afraid. I mean, honestly, when I see these guys, yep. I see enormous amounts of fear. Like they don't, yep. they're not intimidating to me. Yep. Yeah, I was uh, making fun of this guy yesterday who keeps like harassing 21Con on Twitter. And that's exactly what I see too. This guy is like legitimately angry and bitter and you can like see it just like vomiting out on Twitter and there's fear too. Like this is someone he might get laid, but it's like not, it's not, it, whatever it is ain't fun. It's like this weird dark thing. That, yeah. doesn't well, any, that doesn't have any variation to it. Well, you can tell you can tell the desperation and the insecurity when the disagreement moves beyond the issues and it starts devolving into ad hom and character attacks. That's when you know that that they're desperate for a narrative and they have no interest in actually discussing you know the issues at hand. Yeah. Yeah. You you might call what. Like they, they pretty much will just call you blue pill or something if you even start to approach anything from a hard perspective. Mm -hmm. um, now, my perspective is that for if you're on those lower levels, if you're de dealing with, you have tons of like internal baggage and you're attracted to women who have all sorts of baggage, like the blue pill is a really bad place to be because you're, you're in the victim perpetrator circle mm -hmm. and you're the victim, like you are prey. And so the real question is like, but I always think I'm all about questioning assumptions. So it's like, if things aren't like, if you're not happy, you have to, you have to move past it. You have to jump. You have to try to figure out a way to get out of that area because there are different markets. There are different people that you can date. And I, I really see it. Like um, I'll give another framework, which I think is kind of interesting. If you go to like attachment theory. Uh, yeah. You know, I actually want to talk to you about that. I had a window open on it. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah, so attachment theory, I mean, I won't go too too deep into detail about it, but the, the three primary ones are anxious, avoidant, and secure. And so what you can say is that for most of you know recent history, not re recent as in modern history, let's say, mm -hmm. pre pre-sexual liberation movement, pre-feminism, mm -hmm. you, you had a good portion of secure relationships, and then and then also a good portion of avoidant men with anxious women mm. and anxious and avoidant types tend to go to each other. Um, the avoidant usually plays more of the sort of perpetrator role. The, the anxious usually plays more of the victim and, and guys can see this. I've talked about girl game in the past, anxious girls, insecure girls will, will do this thing. And, and for women from a biological, like it, leveraging their biology, it works better being kind of in the anxious position. Cause you can be like, I need you, I need you, blah, blah. And so these guys who- It's more of a feminine role that's gonna be dysfunctional. It is, it is. And, and they, pull, they pull guys into, in, and the guy thinks, oh, I got all this power, she really likes me, blah, blah. But then she's actually like kind of working, like chipping down his barriers. And he's starting to like let her in because he's like, I can afford to be vulnerable now with this girl. And then once she's in, then the dynamic flips. She starts pulling away. Well, that sounds like a covert narcissist game that a lot of narcissist women do. Mm -hmm. It's exactly, it's exactly right. Um, but a lot of, a lot of like anxious women are in that category and they, their whole idea is trying to be needy and trying to, to get attention from the guy and the guy who also has his own kind of baggage. Cause why else would he be with that kind of girl? He likes mm -hmm. to be needed. And so he tries to keep himself away from her. They both have intimacy issues, but that's how they do it. Now, what feminism basically said was that, hey, girls, time to stop being anxious, time to be avoidant. <clears throat> so they sort of flipped it. And then they've been in with the cultural programming with guys. It's been trying to make guys play that anxious role. Mm -hmm. So you have the same kind of dynamic. Now, it's actually even worse, you could argue, because it's really depolarizing yeah. for a guy 
<laughs> to be in the anxious state with and a that's girl. that's what we're seeing in the entire culture right now. This is Which the is depolarization. Every, women are less feminine than ever before. Men are less masculine than ever before, at least in the West. Mm -hmm. 100%. And it's also why they can't even form relationships. Because you could, you could form unhealthy relationships, but they would still form and you could still have families if the guy was avoided and the girl was anxious. But when mm -hmm. the guy becomes anxious, the girl doesn't want anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so the avoidant girl just goes for hookups. Yeah. And, and it was, it's been very interesting because you have this. So basically, this is peak retard on both sides. Peak retard. Boy. Yeah, peak <laughs> retard. Full and, retard. And I actually think this is really interesting because mm -hmm. traditionally there's this whole thing with, you know, women want the relationship with the guy, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, if, and so she's, even if the guy's like got his stuff together, you know, and, and, and I would still say the majority of women are like this if, if they, you know, if they're with a guy that they enjoy seeing and he's attractive, et cetera, he checks the boxes. But a lot of women today, they're, they're so avoidant that they actually like, they, they can't form relationships with guys at all. And that they only, they only want like impersonal transactional sex, which is really historically anomalous. Like it's mm -hmm. a sign of pretty severe trauma. And I'm certain so much of it has to do with terrible issues with their fathers. It's also bizarre because usually this would, uh, historically, because usually this wouldn't be available. Condoms are, I mean, there is this old form of condoms, but like modern condoms are a new thing, birth control pills, IUDs, uh, you know, even the understanding we have of like ovulation, pull and, pull and pray and all this shit, for thousands of years, this didn't exist. Like everybody, you just, everybody's got fucking knocked up all the time. Which yeah. is well, you well, get, let's get killed. Yeah, and and that's true when it came to intercourse. But the type of narcissist, the type of covert narcissist Pat's talking about, these are women who are well versed sexually. So you know they're giving hand jobs, they're doing oral, they're doing anal, they're doing all these other different things. And so that transactional sex, they have more things that they can transact with because they have a higher skill set than the other. And and the thing is, is that with that higher skill set that that sexual activity does break down that male those male walls those that those defenses against that sort of thing so even though this has been going on for an extremely long time um it's it's more often now um characterized with intercourse because of the vast amounts of birth control that are available yeah yeah i could say too that uh, things have gotten on this topic things have gotten so bad in the online dating marketplace just to, like pick a specific example at least in a major American city or relatively major American city like Orlando, I can consistently get girls now off, you know, Tinder and stuff like that to my front door. I've never met them and we'll fuck in 10 minutes flat. Now, part of that to me actually doing it on purpose and like focusing on that, like how can I do this? And that's my own stuff that I'm just doing, right? But it's also, it's, it's, I found it to be counterproductive sometimes, maybe, I don't know what percentage of the time, but a good chunk of the time to even go on dates mm -hmm. because these women are not looking for that. And mm -hmm. it, it slows down this process of what they want to use me for. And so I find it more beneficial if I want to have sex to just go immediately for what I want to do. And it happens literally that fast in like 10 or 12 minutes sometimes. Yeah. So maybe not what they expected, but that's generally what they expected. Hmm. No, yeah, I've been hearing that a ton with, with clients and it's really, it's really fascinating. And it's really, frankly, I mean, I think it's, yeah. it's pretty disturbing. And I don't think even a couple of years ago when I, I got on Tinder after my relationship ended with my ex-wife, uh, like three and a half years ago, and it wasn't quite the same back then. It was more, it was more like 50-50 what would happen and what would be most beneficial, a wine date or something, or just immediate hookup. And now it's just getting more lopsided over time. And I've wondered, of course, of like, is this my own bias? Is this what I'm doing? But I'm like, I have friends who do this too, and all of us are like, it's all going this direction. And it's not healthy, uh, especially for the women. Well, it's not that it's it's not that it's all going that direction, and maybe Steve the Dean can jump in here too. But you know, I've I've experienced situations where even pre online dating, where you know you meet a chick and and in a very short period of time, it's gotten physical, and so I mean it, mm -hmm. it's faster now because of online dating, I think, and because online dating commodifies relationships. Just like you know, I want to buy something at Amazon. Well, I want to buy this piece of pussy. There you go. Yep. But I mean. Even prior to online dating, you know, as an older guy, I mean, I remember going very quickly from one phase to the next, and it's just a question of of, of escalation because that's what she wanted to begin with. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I've gotten down with a lot of this is how to escalate from like an online swipe to text to phone to on my front door, or sometimes theirs, but usually it's mine. Yeah. Humble brag. <laughs> and I, I think a lot of it is also. Um, 
it's it's like there's a selection aspect to it. So there are certain girls, and you can one of the things I go over with with clients on sites is that you can see, you can tell pretty pretty well. I mean, if you if you have a trained eye, mm-hmm. what certain girls are looking for, and I think that um, like a lot of girls are. I mean, I think girls pretty much across the board are obviously all willing to se- sexually sexually escalate faster than they were in the past, but I. I from what I've seen from, from the stats and from also from talking to women, I mean, even, including in New York City, mm. there are- Is that where you're based? Yes, yes. Okay. There's, um, it's, it's like with everything, there, it's separated into two different categories. There are some women who are like barely dating, barely having sex at all. And then there are some that are like going out multiple times a week, different guys yep. and hooking up. And, a lot of the girls in the former category, some are not in, re- some are in relationships. They got in the relationships fast and that's kind of what they do. Um, other ones are, are kind of like semi-female incel. Um, they're not nearly as prominent as the male version of it. Yeah, of course. But I, I know, I know you're talking about, that. I've seen this in real life and it's bizarre. Yeah. These girls get so burned out. They actually go, some of them, you're always, I'm always skeptical, of course, but it's like, you really feel like this girl's just so fucking burnt from doing this stuff. They just stop for a while and they'll eventually pick back up on it. It's like a behavior pattern they fall back into, but they'll go months without getting laid. Mm-hmm. And for them, it's, and it's on, it's on purpose. They're just so burnt out by it. I think somebody is getting really burned out or the guys, there's a lot of, a lot of men out there going this whole world that we live in. is kind of feeling nutsy. Yeah. But it's, uh, I'm, I'm, it's not providing for me what I really want in life. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's one thing to the next. Um, but it's just, uh, pretty much it's just smoking the validation crack pipe or I'm just getting <laughs> validation from these other women and I'm trying to, um, and I get that, but goes back to the whole thing we were talking about earlier with the hyper rationality is if I'm, if I'm living with the hyper rationality, it's the same thing as living with the hypersexuality. It's I'm really missing out on a really big core of my life. You know, Pat, yep. we we're talking about three different categories of there, there are so many more than three. I mean, it, it, there's the, there's all the the spiritual, there's the body, there's the physical, there's there is my mental stuff, but there's so many internal resources that we have, and mm-hmm. the whole thing of not living a life where I'm whole and I'm complete and I'm integrated with all those all the stuff within me, and if I get all bent like like uh, we've been talking about two different categories of actually three when you mentioned the 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 feeling thing. You know, if I'm feeling without thinking and if I'm thinking without feeling or I'm sexual without um, uh, my uh, core or my values and all that, it's like I'm really missing out. And I think the world that we live in with all the sexuality like it is, men are really missing out on living a very integrated life where they're really pursuing what they really want. Yeah, because I don't think what what you guys are describing, interacting with these kind of women is what men really want. I would agree with that. I also think too, to, to kind of dovetail on what Anthony said, where, you know, these women talk about they're getting burnt out. And I think one of the things that most tribes of the manosphere, they don't talk about is what I like to recall, what I like to call binge promiscuity. So, you know how, yeah. like with any other kind of addiction or any other kind of, you know, mental dysfunction. That's what women are doing. Is they're binging on it from time to time. And a lot of guys correct. are this. Yeah, that's what they do. So, so these women are running around and they're pretending to be the conservative next door and they're acting like everything, you know, is, is, is fine at the time, but then they turn around and they do this binge promiscuity where they spend a week or two or three out of the year and, you know, it's open season and they're trying to compete with McDonald's for how many people served. So I think that at the end of the day, you know, that's something that we really need to consider and think about as well, because a lot of times what happens is, is if you don't spend time to get to know the woman that you're interested in, in some sort of deep level, she's just going to compartmentalize you. Mm-hmm. And then when she goes out and does what she does, you're, you're, you're just not going to see it unless you look at it through that, you know, through more of a, an accurate lens. Yeah, we got a super chat question, by the way, we should take that. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Darius Thurman. I've seen this guy before. Five dollars from Darius Thurman. Pat. How do you cure anxious attachment and be secure? Counseling, personal mission, your thoughts? Yeah, um, it's, I mean, guys who fall into the anxious or, or avoidant uh, category, basically, which is two sides of the same coin. I mean, that has to do with a lot of, a lot of trauma usually growing yeah. up. 
Um, and, and it may not even be like when I say trauma, like people think like, oh, it was like serious, terrible things were happening to you all the time. Yeah, it's not like, always like that. Are you familiar? With, like that. Are you familiar with CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder? Um, no, no, no. I, I would, I would be making up if I tried to. <laughs> okay. What, what's? Tell me about it. And I'll, uh, it's, it's basically what you're referring to, in my opinion. I don't know if Ken's familiar with this. He would have. Mm -hmm. um, not. Yeah, so one of our speakers, Richard Grannon, uh, who spoke recently in Poland, he's not the first uh, you know, to focus on this, but it's a big focus for him on his YouTube channel at Spartan Life Coach. It's a big channel, six figures, uh, subscriber count. So complex post-traumatic stress disorder would be, he actually calls it CPTSR, so stress response rather than disorder. Uh, he describes it as like a scattershot uh, series of traumatic events. Hmm. First is like being in a combat veteran, you went through some serious shit, you saw people die, you killed people, you saw your best friend burn his face burn off. These are traumatic events that are obvious and they cause serious harm or they can. And we see these in like culture and movies nowadays. It used to not be you know, respected, of course. There's a whole uh, history of PTSD being accepted, I think, in the psychology, right? Shell shock and it evolved over time. CPTSD is not, I think, treated uh, formally yet, but it might be soon in like uh, diagnostic manuals and stuff. But yeah, it's basically if you had a rough childhood and you had, like, you had a real childhood trauma, but there wasn't any major event, like say you were sexually abused. It was just 15 or 20 years of like emotional neglect, yelling, screaming, things like that. Mm -hmm. That would be CPTSD forming over time. And then you get stuck in those behavioral patterns or responses to those events as an adult when the, when the events are gone. They're not happening anymore. Mm -hmm. But you developed a pattern of behavior that's decades deep. And I think a lot of guys in the manosphere have this. I think I have this, uh, yeah. definitely. It's something that's been, you know, I've had to deal with my entire life. And you know, I've only really come to terms with it in the past couple of years, approaching 30. I'm 31 now. Anyway, I'll end my rant, but no, <laughs> it came to mind with what you're talking about. No, th thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, it's it can be stuff like even if you're, like, I think people have a disposition for it. There's probably a genetic disposition, but it's hugely impacted by environments, but it could be like if you get, you get dropped off for daycare too early and you're, and you're completely, you know, and you're there screaming and you want your mom and your mom's left and everything. And that, that stuff over time, as it gets more and more reinforced, it can cause sort of emotional shutdown regulation. So some things are not very clear about how it happens in people. Other times it is very clear. One big one that happens with guys has to do with their fathers. Um, guys who have a, a bad relationship with their father or a distant relationship with their father profoundly affects a man's self-esteem. Just for women too, but it affects it differently. Because as a guy, you can have a really hard time trying to find yourself if you didn't have that sort of guidance and, and stability growing up. When so, I hear that too, I mean, you're talking about a dysfunctional or unhealthy relationship with the same sex uh, being who created you. You were created by two human beings. They fucked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one of them is same sex. The other one's the opposite sex. See, I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense that it would affect women differently than men. The same way a woman's relationship with her mother would be different than a son's with her his mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem, <clears throat> like a like a bad relationship with a mother, is going to make the guy either way too needy and attached, mm -hmm. or mom. or it's going to. And actually, an interesting subsection of that is that a lot of guys. Uh, I'm Darius. I'm I'm gonna. I'm, 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 this is a cool tangent, though, I want to just mention real fast. A, a lot of guys, you have the caricature guy who is really, really tied into a woman's, um, who, who's like tied to his mother, and he's like a mama's boy, right? He's needy, blah, blah, blah. But there's another subset of that, which is actually the seducer. A lot of seducers are very, very tied to their mothers. Yeah. Uh, they, what they'll basically do is they'll, you know, they'll go and they'll sleep with lots of other women and it's kind of this whole thing, but mom is always top. Mom is always the, the top, kind of top dog and it gets transmuted. They, so become, they become the man that their mother probably fucked to make them. Or mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they learned how to, how to understand women by pleasing their mother, hmm. right? So that's, it's, very, it's very interesting how that stuff works. Um, so that'll create some issues. He's either going to have them go into the more avoidant thing or he's going to be more uh, anxious as a result. But with the father, it's really about a man's identity mm. and his own confidence in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's how, it, that's how it affects it. So how to get over it, how to overcome it. I mean, it's, it, is, it is what I do in large part. I mean, a, a huge part of the stuff that I work on with clients is moving them 
from that sort of anxious and avoidant state and marketplace into a secure one. And so it's getting their own mind in the right spot and also having them be able to discern what women are there or close to being there that they can guide also into that arena. So, yeah, I think the thing about the, to answer Darius's question, the whole cure for anxious attachment, Pat, you're spot on as far as the whole idea of, uh, you know, um, getting to a place where I call it actually refathering yourself because your father is the one who his voice is the one that's going to create confidence in your life. And confidence is the opposite of anxiety. And so that confident thing of you have to step back and and not not worry about the attachment side of things. The only way to, I think, the, to be able to really reclaim that territory is to step back to autonomy or the side of differentiation or finding out who the hell I am. Who mm -hmm. am I? What do I want? Um, and the whole thing you had said, Pat, about identity. Identity is absolutely at the core of this whole journey, finding mm -hmm. out who I really am. And the problem is, is that the narrative about who you are has been spread out. And we listen to so many different voices, our mothers, our fathers, the, the culture, our teachers, all these different people have told us who we are. And so it makes us ang anxious about when I take who I am and I attach with another human being, it's like, am I good enough? Do I have what it takes? Can I handle this? And all the questions that are floating around in us haven't been answered. Mm -hmm. but you have to step back and be able to answer those questions. Am I good enough? Hell yes. That's what a confident statement is. But I have to be able to answer that question before I can move into a relationship and be attached in a secure fashion. I have to do the work of differentiation. And, and you know, it's that, I mean, that was perfectly said, Ken. And I, one, one last thing I'd add to it is that a component of this, and it's great if you can have it happen on both sides, and I do work with guys on, on doing this, but there's a, yeah, you gotta forgive them mm. too. It's if, if, oh, as, long as, as long as if you have to forgive your parents, mm -hmm. basically, and uh, for a lot of guys, like it's really like yeah. you got to forgive your father. And I had that issue. I had a lot of issues with my mm -hmm. father growing up. And now we have like the most incredible relationship. There's just so much love between us now. And it was amazing to do that. And I was very lucky that I was able to transition that relationship because um, I didn't realize it even when I was doing it, to what extent it changed my own sort of internal yeah, ability yeah. to go around about the world. Hey, Pat, tell me more about what, uh, what did you have to forgive your father for? So my father was, he is very, very smart guy, very, very smart guy. And, um, but he basically like ignored me a lot growing up. He was a school teacher focused more on that. But, um, and you know, there is a, there's a period growing up where, like I had like one really good friend, but I didn't, I didn't have any other friends, which, um, and he just would, it was like, it was like, he wanted to be, he, he cared about like me being, he would always ask me about like what the cool kids were doing and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And he kind of elevate my best friend as if my best friend was even supposed to be like, like what would it was like the better son. Like he kind of wished that he had him. Like there's all mm -hmm. sorts of little things that he did. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just felt like I couldn't, and I couldn't live up to him basically. You couldn't measure up to that. Yeah. Couldn't measure up to him. He wasn't, it wasn't like he was, and, and yeah, it was just like little ton of criticisms or ignoring me basically. Um, but the thing is like with my father, I mean, my father was, had no relationship with his parents. He was like right, wasp right. Up, upbringing. They went out and they were socialites and he was kind of left with the, you know, the nanny and he had all sorts of trauma of his own that he didn't, that he didn't really deal with. And so, I mean, I, I, I kind of fought with him at the end of my time in college and um, told him how I felt and we and not kind of took us about three years, but we, I mean, all of that to me is like completely in the past. I mean, now it's actually mm -hmm. like, it's bad because he like, el he elevates me too much now. <laughs> and it's like, it's kind of awkward and embarrassing, but, uh, and, it's but a, yeah. and oftentimes it's a little bit too late. You know, it's like you needed that, you needed that where I'm proud of you back when you were in your, the times when you were a kid, you know, rather than the little bit of criticism and comparison that you got. And it's awesome to be able to forgive because that does help us to move on from that place of uh, my heart longs for a father's voice that speaks deeply to my soul and my identity. Um, and if I don't get it, we have that, we have that little bit of bitterness in there 
but we've got to reclaim that space for ourselves as men. Mm -hmm. I mean, he told my mother that he had never, he never had a relationship with his father until his mm -hmm. father was dying. He like never had like a conversation with him Yeah, really. And it was like, that's, so that's how he thought it was supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, how am I supposed to hold a grudge to someone who was like that? Like, it's not what Absolutely. he wanted. He wanted to have a relationship with me just to know how. Yeah, it sounds like you put a stop to multi-generational trauma that was going to keep recycling through history. <laughs> so, Absolutely. That's, yeah. that's awesome. Good shit, man. Let's refocus a little bit on the red pill as a community and as a concept uh, specific to the manosphere. Uh, are there some major, I mean, you have some more notes we can go through as well. But can you talk to me a little bit more about some basic concepts that are thought to be fundamental to the red pill community, such as AWOL? Like, do you agree with that? Do you not agree with it? There's a partial agreement. For example, with myself, AWOL, all women are like that. I do believe that women are fundamentally similar. They're half of the human race. They share fundamental biology and physiology. They've evolved for a couple hundred thousand years along with us and alongside of us. Um, but I don't believe that women are all literally identical mm -hmm. and that it's AWOL should be a useful tool. So that's my take on it in brief. Do you have thoughts on AWOL? Is it abused? Is it, is it overused in the community? Is it, maybe is there still use for it? What are your thoughts on it? Well, I think, all women are like that biologically, like no question about it. I mean, hypergamy is, is accurate. It's an accurate way to describe the biological impulse of women, just like men being interested in younger, more fertile women is a biological impulse of all men. I mean, they're, they're two sides of the, they're the two sides of the same coin they're, That's like the shadow of men, basically, that that is all that a guy is going to fixate on. Just like for a woman, all she's going to fixate on is, is hypergamous impulses. So you have the biology that's that's the same, but then you have psychology and the psychology is different. Some of it's modulated by the trauma stuff we were talking about. Some of it is also just distinct personality types and distinct ways of kind of navigating the world. Um, and you're saying then that these are significant ways that affect their behavior. Uh, yes. separate from Separate from the fundamentals that they share. Yes, it's, it's like another variable that you have to sort of add into the equation. I think mm. that from what I've, from, you know, my, my experience with it is that women, okay, they're hypergamous, but how they're going to manifest their hypergamy is dependent on their health, their psychological health, right? Where their orientation is, but also the means in which they're going to do it are going to also go through the, through their personality type. And I, and I use, you know, I, I, I'm very public of using MBTI as a, as a really good heuristic system. I think it, it helps to make a lot quicker calculations in terms of understanding personality patterns. Um, but on a higher level, there's even beyond personality, you have just when people really start to transcend their personality, you could say, and that's really getting closer to, I mean, again, I'm going to be a little esoteric here, but that's really getting close to love and getting co close to, well, as I would say, I, it's getting close to, to God. And as that happens, a lot of the personality <clears throat> patterns and stuff even start to reduce because you're just like, you're just very open and you're, and you're much more accepting the people you care about and you know, you understand stuff. So are all women like that? Like in some ways, yeah. In some ways not. So I guess not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I found it to be a pretty useful tool or one of the most interesting things I found when I found the Ripple community, but I'm following along and it's, it's good to hear this kind of conversation. Usually this is, this would just, just get uh, shut out. You'd get ejected, blue pill cock, get the fuck out of here, all the stuff. So how dare you have a different opinion? I, I just want to, I, I do want to emphasize though, like you, like it's very important. And this is, I think the value in the community is it's, it's very important to understand the female shadow. Mm. Like if you mm -hmm. don't understand it, you will be blind to it. And there's a very, very good chance you're going to get consumed by it at some point. Yep. It, it will, it will go after you. Ooh. Um, I mean, a good chunk of women have personality disorders, including cluster Bs, which are, you know, predators posing as house pets half the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. My, my, my big thing is discernment. Um, and it's, it, it's, I, I, I like to think that mine is very good, although it takes time to develop. Um, it's just something I work on with clients, but really trying to understand like red flags, things about people's mm -hmm. behavior. This is one of the things, uh, not to not to go back to it a little bit, but it's one of the things I could tell very quickly about Rolo, which is that he's a narcissist. 
Yep. And you can you can just tell from from the way that he engages with stuff. Um, so anyway, that was, yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I'm able to kind of pick people who are like good, good people. And I associate with them. It's why well, I don't, I don't get burned by people because I know when someone's like fucked up, like I know when there's something wrong with them and I stay away and it's the same thing for women. Right. So it's a lot of it's getting guys to not, um, it's not putting women on a pedestal, right. That's part of it, but it's also like really understanding, okay, this is a woman I can, I can invest and I can be honest with. This is a woman who's just fundamentally dishonest and there's nothing I can possibly do in the relationship that's going to end well for me. And so it's like, don't date that woman. Like that's the answer to it. Or like apply red pill principles and have fun with that trench warfare. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's, yeah. And, and let's, let's be real, right? When you find some chick that you're really interested in, you're sexually attracted to, you know, she's a covert narcissist and everything else. If you decide to make that decision, you know, that's one of those things where you have to leave her mid love bomb, you know, because, because after the love bomb ends, it's, it's going all downhill. Well, you're playing with fire is what you're doing. And most yeah. guys are not going to be able to deal with that. And it's like, even if you're good with dealing with it, it still is always a risk. There's all kinds of real life emotional stuff that can happen where you get sucked in. There's legal stuff, false domestic uh, violence accusations, false rape allegations, all kinds of shit. Oh, yeah. It's a dangerous game. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, for myself, I, I avoid the majority of that, you know, these days. But, you know, I mean, I slipped on a banana peel once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but it's so easy to get caught up in, in uh, you know, we're talking about all women are like that and everything. And, and there's a corner of women, just like there's a corner of men who are, uh, like you said, they're immature. They have a sh their shadow. They've been dealing with trauma, you know, and it's like, and Pat, I love what you're talking about. And Sean Smith talks about this as well, vetting women and being able to find out if they're able to be held accountable or if they're able to have the character that you want in a, in a relationship. And that's what's really important, being able to pay attention to, what, what's my gut say? What's my intuitive say? And, and moving forward with what I want. Because um, most guys get sucked into these horrible relationships because they're going after a relationship for the wrong reason. They're going at it for this woman's going to complete me. This woman's going to yes. make me feel better about myself. This woman's going to make me whole. This woman's going to answer the questions that my father didn't. You know, am I good enough? Oh, she likes me. Therefore, you know, I, I go to her like a moth to the flame. And it's like those women that we go to without paying attention to what our gut's saying, saying, run away, run away. There's red flags. Um, we get caught up in it and that's where we get, we get fried. And, but I'm just, what I want to say is that we, yeah, there's a lot of stories of guys getting burned by women, but there's a hell of a lot of good women that have good hearts that have a lot of good character. And it's our, our place to be able to pick and choose from our values, from our character to find out the woman that we really uh, that really does fit us, that fits our values. Ken, that was amazing. And I want to use it just to jump off on something really fast because this is something I, I've been thinking about. The self-awareness is the most important thing. And I think that one of the one of the big issues with you know these sort of red pill circles is that they understand women, at least on a certain level, but they don't really understand themselves very well. Mm. And it's the self-awareness that allows you to choose different ways of, to kind of change patterns. Like the reason that everything seems like this is the way it is, it's this fixed reality. It's like, well, that's because you are fixed in this way and you refuse to change who you are and change your own perception of things. And so be, they basically like resign themselves to having certain feelings of, you know, resign themselves to certain trauma and if that's your paradigm, then yeah, there's no escape. But yeah. We have a couple of viewer questions here we can get to as well. I'd like to get to them. And uh, then we can hop back into some red pill stuff to have some more questions. In the meantime though, guys, as well, before we get to the viewer ones on uh, text, phone lines are open. You can call up Steve the Dean here. We'll get you on the show. Phone number is 515-605-9373. You're welcome to call in, hop on the show. If you have the balls to man up and <laughs> call in. We'll be. We'll probably be nice. We won't hang up on you, <laughs> unless unless you're a dick. In which case, yeah. we'll hang up on you. Uh, before we get any to any of that, though, we have two questions here to get to. One is from Michelle Mead. I think this viewer was on yesterday on the stream. I did. Do you think this trend will continue as Gen Z comes of age? Since it suggested they are more conservative. This was uh, a little bit earlier in the show. I missed this one. 
I think it was a uh, reference to like hookup culture, Tinder, Bumble, online dating, uh, the way sex is, uh, you know, falling off a cliff, like these bin, you know, these binges that women go on and men, you know, using online dating and then you just get burnt out by all the shit. <clears throat> so do you have any thoughts on Gen Z and hookup culture, Pat? Let's open a little panel to you guys. Yeah, uh, I do actually. Um, so we're going through a divergence right now. And so you're seeing some are, are leaning more into that area. Others are, are pulling away and, and they're, they are becoming more conservative. Um, this is something actually, it was something that I mentioned in some of my dialogue with Rolo early on is that if you want to change female behavior, men have to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a guy who, you know, you have your shit together, you're in shape, you know, you're successful, you're confident, which a lot of which comes from like mass, like mastering your sexual urge and whatnot. Like your women are going to adjust their behavior to you, which is, which is one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of these guys are LARPing, but it is interesting to see the trend of like thought patrolling and these guys who are, you know, often talk to me, talk to me about thought patrolling. What, what does this mean? It's like the thought audit, like the tax thing or something else. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thought, for those who don't know, it's a very Gen Z term, that hoe over there, just like a hoe. It's just like the new, the new word for it. Yeah. But it's basically like patrolling them in the sense of, you know, patrolling their behavior. So like a girl will like be posting and some sort of scaling things like, tell me what you're, th tell me what you're thinking. It's like, you know, and they'll just basically make fun of her and they'll tell her to, you know, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tell her to F off. Like I saw some video the other day of a bunch of young guys in Argentina were surrounding a church basically that some like naked women were trying to enter. Um, you know, this is, uh, and not to go really far down, I like a political thing, but, but the trend is definitely towards an ascendant um, right, mo right wing movement among the youth. It's as a reaction to things that are going on right now in culture. Um, so, but as those guys, I mean, if, if this trend continues and the guys become really strong and really, like women will adjust their behavior for it because women always want the top guys, right? Like that's it. And I think this is the thing. People have no vision. They have no imagination. They're like, oh, everything's doomed, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, like read any part of history. Like things go in cycles and, you, and things can always be shifted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can always be shifted. And if as a guy, you become the strongest one, you set the tones, you set the morals for society. Right now we have a bunch of libertines that are – and, you know, frankly, I'll be honest, like a lot of degeneracy that just kind of ruling society. And if mm -hmm. guys who have their shit together say no, women are going to change because what are they going to do? They're going to go for like the disgusting guy who wants to have sex with them. Women never do that. Well, and, and what's interesting about that, just to kind of dovetail on that a little bit, is this idea of, of this libertine degeneracy and all the virtue signaling in support of it. I mean, it's it's insane over the last... I don't know, probably I'd say three or four years of all the degeneracy that I have seen, not just from the left, but even for certain people who, mm -hmm. who call themselves red pill in the manosphere, they're, they're trying to virtue signal for what is obviously degenerate and psychologically unhealthy behavior. In addition to, you know, the other types of lack of, of, of healthiness that these behaviors engender. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, when it comes to some of this stuff, some of these people who virtue signal this, they've gone full retard. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that's pissed me off about the manosphere over the past couple of years is that I've been trying to bring in successfully in some cases, using the Red Man Group and 21 Convention, an element, a, a larger element of fatherhood and patriarchy and discussion about these issues. And, you know, even guys like Black Label Logic, a former panelist in the show, uh, he recently said a couple of weeks ago on Twitter, I saw and it because it, it captured perfectly what I was talking about. He said he missed the manosphere when it was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll or something like that. And this is largely in, jet, in part in jest, but it was also a real uh, expression to think of what he was thinking. And I don't have a problem particularly with that kind of behavior. I've done this myself. I know and respect guys who do this. I know guys who go through different phases and stages of this in their life, kind of binging on it, getting in and out of it and stuff. As they're going through the journey in life as a man, figuring shit out and taking mm -hmm. action. It's that these guys want us to respect their involvement in the manosphere, but they don't want to respect any involvement from any serious involvement in discussion of fatherhood, you know, lowering degeneracy and culture and all these other things. So it's like this SJW mentality. Tolerate me, but I'm not going to tolerate you. So it's, it's this hypocritical fucking position they have. 
it's really retarded. It's not masculine. I don't like it at all. And it's been changing over the past, let's say, you know, maybe a year with Red Man Group Patriarchs and with the Patriarch edition of the conference we had. Well, I mean, I think that guys who are obsessed with that stuff, especially as they come into middle age, like, I think it shows that a lot of arrested development going on. Um, I, I am, like, I help guys get laid. Like, how dare you? How dare you? Right? <laughs> like, I, but, I, but one of the big things for me is everything is about self-awareness. So I'm always like, like, pay attention to how you're feeling throughout this entire process. So I'm like, I think that, you know, I, I, not to use a, the expression, but like, I think people find like God through the gutter. I think it's a very common way. And in a society today when everything has been so promoted, sure, it's cool if you have some guys who are like, all I want is a really serious relationship with a, with a good girl. I'm gonna focus on all sorts of inner stuff and just go for that. And they wanna target it, you know? I'm not saying that they need to go and be promiscuous if that's not what their heart wants. Mm. But a lot of guys, they have insecurities around that. So it's like, okay, go date mm. some girls. But like, don't look at this stuff as if it's just like, pay attention to if it's making you happy or not. And what happens with like, effectively 100% of my clients is that on a you know year timeline, like after we're working together, right? But like, even during the process, they, they can feel their orientation change. And so they start to get they start to get girls, and then you know maybe maybe date a couple of girls at the same time, and then they're like, well, actually, I want more meaning in my life, and then they move beyond mm -hmm. that. And I think that that is the real problem is you have a bunch of like, you know, nihilists who who never really, who were like ne never felt cool or whatever, and they're so they have no sort of sense of meaning in their life, and they actually think that meaning is like some sort of sign of of weakness, like you're like, cause they, it, it's again, like we were talking about before, there's like a trauma aspect to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean. Well, I, I think that when, you, when you're talking about that too, one of the easy ways to spot these types of guys are the guys that are rational at the expense of their emotional side. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys can talk yeah. about the things from a theoretical sense, they can talk about it from a rational sense. But the second that you start having this conversation about how this affects the emotional man, how how this affect, you know, how the ethics affect his emotional well-being, I think that's when all of a sudden, that's when all of a sudden they start falling by the wayside. And that's when you, it's easy to go, okay, that voice on the internet, that person there is a narcissist and they're only caring about their cult of personality. They don't really care about, you know, the ethical requirements of, you know, what they need to have for their audience. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think a lot of them is shoe ethics because they see it. I mean, if, if you don't have any sense of meaning in the world and if you think people are just animals, then, I mean, you, it's all like, let me get what I can get for myself. But the funny thing is like, I don't, I don't personally find any, I mean, I, I know that we talk about dialogue and, and whatnot and dialogue is a good thing. Like we should definitely he, like, talk to people on this stuff. But to me, it's like, that's no different than the kind of shit that comes out of the worst institutions in the world right now. Mm. Like it, it really just like, it's the same kind of stuff that promotes like, it's, you know, teenage girls doing anal and whatnot. Like it's, it's really, to me, it's like, I don't have any sort of, I, I don't, I don't understand these people. I think that there's a very big difference between like, you know, do what you want with your life, but people who like actually put doing all this stuff as like a god like that is the meaning of life is mm -hmm. to seek as mm -hmm. much hedonistic pleasure as possible mm -hmm. i think to answer michelle's question i think a big part of this is is that the somebody out there and this is my hope for the younger generations is somebody out there is seeking some kind of wisdom they're starting to watch you know it's uh it's said that the uh the smart man learns from uh his mistakes the are the why Let's see how to, sorry, the <laughs> wise man learns from his mistakes. The other, the smart man learns from others' mistakes. Nah, something mm -hmm. like that. But anyway, they're learning from somebody else. They're learning the wisdom. These, these, a whole generation is screwing them themselves up. They're messing up their lives. They're doing all this stuff. They're, they're, um, and I, my hope is that the younger generation is going to see, <clears throat> I don't want to get into that kind of debt. I don't want to get into that kind of ruin. I don't want to get into that kind of, promiscuity that's just is just kind of erasing your soul i don't want to deal with this stuff and my hope is that some people are actually watching some of the younger people and mm. they're choosing let's do this differently 
let's find let's find out how we can do this in a wise fashion. Well, here's a fun a fun follow up question: Are we suffering from the sins of our fathers, the boomers? Uh, I mean, in my opinion, you know, there's there's very obvious versions of this, like Social Security being beyond bankrupt. But also, I mean, that, that's just a political and financial issue. I mean, there's issues, I think, in my opinion, there's parallels to that in, in culture that we're feeling. Do you have any thoughts on that? <clears throat> well, as far as uh, Elliot had had his conversation at the Patriarch about the, you know, the degenerate age and doing relationship in a degenerate age. And you wonder how much the uh, how much the boomers of which I'm at the very end of the boomers, the young boomer. Mm. And uh, and it's like, uh, man, I remember growing up, it was it was the time. This is where the the sexual revolution happened. This is where feminism really started to grow. This is where, you know, people were really questioning the Vietnam War. I mean, it was like there was a lot going on and tons of things shifted mm. in our culture. And so like blaming the boomers for the beginning of this. Sure. You know, they all it's a, it's what where it all started to become more degenerate, to become more open become more, um, I don't know what else you'd call it. I don't even know if I'm answering your question, but uh, uh, it's just it, a, it was a saying I heard recently, just that every generation suffers from the sins or lack thereof of their fathers. Yeah. And I, I had not seen it put that way before, aside from the boomer stuff. That's been well, I think, that, I think that when it comes to the boomers and I think when it comes to a lot of this, I mean, I think it's easy to blame the other generations because, Absolutely. you know, as a, gen, as a Gen Xer, you know, I'm going to have millennials blaming me and I blame millennials for a lot of things. But I think that, that the reality is, is that I think that when we talk about generational disparities, I think the biggest mistake that we make in most cases is not discussing the lack of multi-generational men mentorship within our own families and within our own communities. And I really think that that's been the biggest tragedy when it comes to masculinity across the, mas the manosphere, regardless of the tribe, is because the lack of multi-generational mentorship when it comes to this sort of you know grooming strong masculine men to be strong masculine men, the issue that I see with it is that because we don't have that, every generation of men is becoming less and less masculine. They're becoming less and less psychologically grounded. They're becoming, you know, they, they don't have uh, you know mental or psychological resilience. And so you see a lot of these people, they act out in more and more extreme ways. I mean, you look at a lot of these mass shooters, for example, not to segue too far, but over 96% of them come from broken homes where they didn't, they weren't raised by their biological father. And just as importantly, they weren't raised by their biological mother and their biological father in a home in the bonds of marriage, mm -hmm. right? So we didn't have mass shootings prior to that. But when you start to see societal breakdown, what ends up happening is, is when you destroy the family, you, you see these massive societal unforeseen consequences. And you look at a lot of minority communities and, you know, they were the canary in the coal mine. And now they're now these, these same social um, plagues are, are affecting every community now. And that's, that's a serious issue. And it's an issue that, that I think is one that the manosphere is in the best place to address, but the silence is almost deafening there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so, did someone say something? I just said, we'll put, Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm like, I, I love that. Like that was, that was really spot on. Um, I'm going to be like a little bit of a boomer defender here for a second, or <laughs> at least uh, try to contextualize some things. Cause I, I have the same. So, so you're feeling. saying you're going to be a trans boomer. I'm going to be, I'm a trans boomer right <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, Pat, when you get into that, like I was just thinking about, you know, who raised the boomers, the greatest generation, right? Where did they fuck up along the way? The big mistake the boomers <laughs> made, and, and I'm I'm controlling this conversation from the sense of ignoring any potential um, subversion and whatnot that influenced ideas that came about, but focusing on the on like the boomers and their state of mind. I think it's really t tough for a lot of us to understand what happened in the first half of the 20th century. You had countries that basically like controlled the, you know, controlled the world. We were technology, everything was moving forward. And then a hundred million people were killed. Like we had massive, massive wars and it created a very, very like, like, you know, we talk about the greatest generation, you know, going through a depression, mm -hmm. they, and then also the fact that they were in factories and stuff. So they maybe weren't around as much with their kids, right? The story that you hear from the boomers growing up is they had all these fathers who were tough guys, but a lot of them were very, very 
you know, they, they were not like spending a lot of time with their kids and whatnot. The kids kind of had a lot of free reign. And, and if you just look at like the state of society, there was a big, there was like a lot of trauma. There was a lot of trauma in society. And I think that there was a natural inclination for them to try to like have some individual in, individuality come out and to try to like open up their hearts, right? Because they've maybe felt that that was really repressed. The problem is that the way they went about it was terrible. They basically took all these things and, and you know, maybe we need to move to a different level of consciousness so we prevent the wars and stuff from happening again and so that we can relate to people on a different level. Maybe, you know, the 50s, everyone idolizes the 50s, but there's, and, and there are a lot of good things to it, but a lot of it was is also like marketing. Like there was a lot of also repression and people very unhappy in relationships. Everything was very, very forced because everyone thought the world was going to end. Mm. So... Yeah, there so was a, used to live in fear of constantly blowing up in the Soviet Union. I know exactly. my dad, my, my parents and they were kids, especially my dad, he grew up in Miami, so they used to do drills where you'd get under the desk as a kid. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, bomb, the bombs were going to drop, which is just yep. you know, fucking useless. Yeah. But, so, so they had this whole thing, and they were, they were trying to, to find they, – they, but their mistake was that they thought that everything that came before them was wrong and bad. And mm -hmm. so they had this big backlash to it. And so they, they – threw away things when it came to all sorts of things that had grounded the like countries for centuries, all sorts of political policies. And they kind of embraced almost like a complete destruction of society, at least on the higher levels, right? Or they were just naive to how things could have consequences. Like they shut down their brains, right? They were so open with their hearts to shut down their brains. And this might be like the sexual liberation movement for women, which all these betas thought would get them uh, or less masculine thought that would get them all this pussy, but the opposite happened. Yeah, I yeah. mean, relationships. Like, I, I, I think that there is a there's a potential. And I think that we we can have a reconciliation. Like, it's not going to go back to how it was before. In my opinion, it's never going to go back to yeah. and what was before. Right? There's all different ages that. And why, why would you want that anyway? Because look where it ended up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. The problems. Yeah. There were problems that caused this backlash. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the pendulum swung too far in the direction. So. I think our real role here is to like go back to the roots and see, wait a minute, this stuff was good, right? But then there are also some problems here and acknowledge where the problems were and, and build from there. And, and I think if we, the guys who do that, I mean, we're going to inherit the world and we're going to build a new mm -hmm. world. And I think it's really amazing. The sort of that, That's like the, the, the amazing part about this community is that there mm -hmm. is this, this side of it of people who are really like creative and and driven to see a better society, better mm -hmm. relationships between men and women, mm -hmm. and uh, better nations. That's what I do. That's what I think about every day and work on with my company. Well, mm -hmm. several I have now. Yeah, I like that perspective, Pat, <laughs> because it's like uh, some people are sitting there, you know, with the label, enjoy the decline. This is all going to hell in a handbasket and all that. Mm -hmm. And it's really being represented by all the different movies that are out there that are the dystopian future, that this is what the future looks like. It's all falling apart. But I love the idea that there is there are um, a con there's a conversation going about how do we make this thing? How do we empower men? How do we bring back our soul? How do we bring back our presence in our homes and in our community? And I just love that idea because that's going to change everything. Yeah. yeah. You know, Ken, I've always found it difficult too to understand how anyone, man or woman, could enjoy watching their country burn down slowly. Mm -hmm. Like I don't that. There is no enjoying the decline. Yeah. It's just, no. it's beyond stupid. No, because yeah. you're sitting there. If you don't have kids, I got kids and I don't have grandkids yet, but man, I want the, the best thing for them for ever. I want mm -hmm. them to have the best and, and yeah, be able to, uh, be, to, for me to provide as much as I can to be able to create a world that is, is really powerful and abundant and beautiful. Yeah. I don't have any kids yet that I know of, but I just love my country and I love the... <laughs> And there, there's problems with it, obviously, that I've, you know, very sharp criticisms, criticisms of. But I love this place. This is where I grew up. It's my home. I've traveled pretty well around the world, and it's still my favorite place on the planet. Uh, Poland, I guess, would be a close second. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, this country is, you know, it's fantastic. And it was given to me for free. All yeah. I did was mm -hmm. I was just born here, and I inherited, you know, very positive, strong, masculine decisions that have been going on for generations in this country. America is one of the oldest republics in the world now. And that's obviously influenced the entire West. So the whole world. We have some more, uh, I don't know if we have any phone line questions, but we got some more chat, uh, text ones here to pop in. Um, we'll get to these uh, one by one or in order. This is from earlier in the show. 
Omar Tin. I like his little uh, icon there for his thumbnail. <laughs> Omar Tinoco, Tinder. Do you ever challenge yourself and apply the game toward high value women at Cold Approach, Panera, or Starbucks? I'm guessing he was referring to me. I thought anyone that wants to hop in on this. And is he saying that uh, high value women are at Panera Bread? Apparently, in Starbucks, it's oddly specific. Well, there uh, you go. Achievement unlocked and mystery solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me just go to let me get off the show and go to Starbucks. I've actually, yeah, I've met some good. I've actually fucked a few women out of Starbucks. Uh, one in London one time was pretty epic during a uh, day game conference, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but yeah, I've uh, even in Poland actually met a girl not at Starbucks. Uh, really hot, really hot uh, Polish chick. It was it was great. I ended up banging her, but I wanted to date with her, and then it's kind of fucked off eventually. I was in a bad mood. It's like I'm out of here. But yeah, there's, I mean, women go to all sorts of places that are have all sorts of personalities and stuff, like Pat was talking about. So yeah, I, I meet women during the day and stuff. But personally, you know, I don't go to Panera. It's been a while. But Starbucks, coffee shops, walking around, anywhere like that. Yeah, you can meet women all the time. And they, they might be shitty quality too, though. I mean, women on Tinder are women on seeking arrangements, you know, being sugar okay. babies. Are women on Bumble pretending to want relationships? Our woman at bars getting shit faced. Our woman at the next day drinking Starbucks to heal the hangover. <laughs> so it's it's a whole cycle of life. And I so I, in Orlando, Orlando such is, is a super diverse world city. They call it. Um, it's got this like certain classification in uh, you know certain studies, and you see this. I see. I see. I would literally see the same girl on Tinder, Bumble, seeking arrangements, Instagram, and then like six months later, I see at a bar. And, and so I know what kind of life. Now this is not all women. This is not. This is only. This is a very specific subset to see that. But I've seen that repeatedly, and it at first used to blow my mind. I'm like, holy shit! But now I know that there's just you know different levels of this. Some girls would tinker with these things. Some girls won't do any of this stuff. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of women. I think most of them don't use these apps and stuff like that. Maybe they will, or they did for a short time to get you know railed or tinker around with it. But yeah, you can find all kinds of women in all kinds of places, and I don't think. Uh, so I'll do that, but I don't think Starbucks is you know special or anything like that. No, I'll tell you this: the special place is that you find hotels that actually have lounges. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've heard. <laughs> so I've I can heard. neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> yeah, we had some really hot women at the uh, Poland Convention Hotel on Saturday night specifically. They were just hanging out in the lobby. <laughs> it, was, it was interesting. I yep. wonder what they were doing there. I wonder, yeah. Yep. A little cultural enrichment. Yeah, exactly. I'm scrolling through. Uh, here's a little comment. Yeah, I love Hunter Drew. What he watches the stream a lot. He's a host of our Patriarch edition. Small groups like FOE. That's a f his fraternity of excellence. War Room, etc. Working to turn that tide and get more role models out there. FOE is a proud sponsor of RMG and Twenty One. Fuck yeah, Hunter Drew's the man. He is a man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking through the comments here. I've not been keeping up with them. We got a call on the line, Anthony. Yeah, let's take it. Let's do it. All right, area code seven three two. You on? What's your name? What's your question? Hello, can you hear me? What's your name? What's your question, man? Uh, I'm Darius. Oh, hey, Darius. Can hey, man. Me? Oh, from the chat. Thanks for calling in, man. Yeah. I I put in the super chat earlier. Uh, uh how to deal with uh, attachment? How to deal with a uh, Anxious attachment disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Can yeah, you, yeah. Can you just ask and answer the question? When we say what is going on, I've been quiet. Please, man, answer the question. What is your question? That's why we're quiet so you can ask your question. So, what is your question? He hung up. I wonder if he, I don't think he heard us. Maybe uh, he just heard silence. No. Yeah, it sounds like his, his cell connection might have been bad. Sometimes it happens when the cell towers don't do it right. Mm. Yeah, he'll survive. Anyway, let's hop back into the Red Pill stuff. Pat, what are some other major criticisms or disagreements you have or agreements with the Red Pill community at large? Or you um, could go into the you know, Rollers version of it, whatever you want to do on that. There's two different coins of that or sides. Well, I, I just, I think that. <laughs> It's the, so I'll, I, I wrote about this a little bit ago. I think that for guys who, who are in a really, really low state, like they're near suicide or like their entire life has fallen apart and pretty much all, all they have 
in them is negativity and, and fear and complaining. I think that that's a, like a lot, like those guys for, for one, this is, and this is well proven. They're the ones who are most susceptible to cult leaders because cult leaders promise them certainty and something to kind of hold on to. And that certainty would come in the form of like secret knowledge and things like that. Right. Correct. Like, yeah. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. So, join my Patreon. You'll get secret knowledge on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an NDA, right? Yeah. Um, hey, now I resemble that. <laughs> so I, I think that for guys who are at the very end of the route, that can be like, I mean, it's better than suicide, right? Obviously it's to have something like if your entire world is collapsed to have someone who promises you something like that can bring you up a little bit energetically. But the problem is that, you know, you have in, in the case of Rolo in particular is that they keep them there. So it's not like a stepping stone. It's not like I'm going to meet you where you're at. Sure, go and complain, go vent. Like guys who are at a very low level, they mostly they mostly want to feel a little bit more power, which they get from, as we just said, secret knowledge and whatnot. But they also just want to complain, like and complaining for them and giving them the space to complain. It's that's like like if you were to have a conference and you'd bring a bunch of those guys in there, just like allowing them to complain and vent, they'd feel better after the conference. But mm. I don't do that. Like, it's a uh, it's a coping mechanism. It sounds like you're just vomiting. Well, if if I could interject real quick here, I think that's really one of the biggest issues that I have with a lot of content creators that cater to the incel community is that they do exactly what Pat Stedman's talking about. They they give them this idea of certainty, and then they keep them in that area, and they and they retard their growth and i mean that in the in the true sense i don't mean that in a in a defamatory sense at all so a lot of these guys because i've seen guys in the incel community who just aren't incels but they're going through a trauma or a tragedy in their life where they think that that's their self perception and then they they can't move out of it and they they get stuck in like this this uh, gerbil run psychological narrative of negative self talk and that's where they think they're at and there are content creators out there not just Rolo and not just some of the others, but there are people out there, they want to keep them in that spot. They want to keep them addicted and they want to keep them kind of at the the Patreon tit, so to speak, so that they can't grow, so that these guys become dependent psychologically and emotionally on these content creators. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah. Darius is calling back in. Let me see if we can patch him back in. Darius, uh, we're opening the line up for you, dog. Go ahead. What do you got for it? For having me on uh, uh i was listening to you guys earlier and you brought up a lot of good points uh, my my dad wasn't around for my family when i was a kid uh my parents were never married uh my dad was never around mm. sorry to hear that man I haven't yeah. seen my dad in 17 years. So if he's alive, which he might not be, he, I'm not really sure what kind of relationship we could have. Mm. Mm. Do you have a specific question in line with this that we can answer? I already forgave him, but... Caller, can you hear us? specific I question think, yeah. is... How do I have, how do I have self worth that isn't contingent on results? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. The question, you know, how do I have self worth that is not contingent well, on results that may I, may, are outside of you? Like, how right? do I drop outcome dependency? Well, exactly. I, I think that when it comes to that, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of spearhead this a little bit. First and foremost, you have to look at your life and look at what you do that's successful right now. Because the reality is, is that any man to have self-worth requires results. So the thing you got to look at is, is that what are you doing right now that is successful for you? I mean, obviously you were capable of calling on the phone, so you made enough money to either have a cell phone service or something like that. I mean, some of us got to start at a real basic level. But the point is, is that, you know, everybody's talking about, well, you, you don't want to have results. The reality is, is that I think Pat said it earlier um, in the beginning of the stream that, you know, men are based, you know, who they are is based on what they do. 
it's based on, you know, men are men of action and successful men are men of successful action. And so look at the results of what you're doing right, right now, and then try to slowly but surely create more successful things that you can do in your life, regardless of where you're at. You know, if you can't do four pushups today, well, you know, keep doing pushups and then maybe tomorrow, you know, or, or next week or next month, you're doing 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 pushups. The point is, is that it's consistency. So I think that the real big issue is the more consistent you can be, the more successful you're going to be, but it all requires effort. You're, you're never going to say, I'm a successful man when you can't demonstrate any kind of past success in your life. Mm -hmm. and, and Darius, I'd also jump in and say that one of the, like all of us are on a journey. And when I was 21 years old, when I was first getting involved with this stuff, like if I went to a party with people I didn't know, I'd have a panic attack in 20 to 30 minutes, so I'd have to go home. I couldn't, I couldn't be around people. I think everybody there was judging me. People didn't like me. It's a, I mean, now it's like I can make a friend in like a couple of minutes at a party. I don't have any anxiety at all. But the part, point is that like, this is a journey. And so we want to get results and results come from it. But if you can really enjoy the process of learning and changing yourself, and learn to just embrace the fact that at times things are going to be difficult. Like you've already experienced a lot of difficulties, but things can get better if you want them to get better. And this is life. I mean, and, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Like I look back at these times when I had so many problems and like, I look back at it with nostalgia. Cause it's like, I was just like a kid who, was lost in the world, didn't have a good relationship with his father, his girlfriend broke up with him, didn't know how to talk to women. It's like, enjoy the journey, man. Enjoy the journey, even when it's tough, because it makes it more rewarding in the end when you do get there. The sweet and the sour, right? Yep. I want to take a little bit of a different uh, turn than DDJ did. I think what you're talking about with, uh, you know, the whole thing of act, uh, action, accomplishment, mastery, those things are definitely uh, things that you accomplish with our masculinity. But when it comes to self-worth, I think it depends. It's less dependent on those external things or those accomplishments. You got to be able to find self-worth from an internally validated place. I am good enough. I am worthy. I am valuable. I am acceptable. And that, that journey comes from not from winning football games or not from women liking me or not from getting straight A's. It's, it's I am valuable and worthy. We have to find that from an internally frame of reference. And that's a really important thing to be able to consider. And Ken, sure. that, would be, that would be things like self-dialogue, uh, self-belief and self- -love. Absolutely. Listening to what the inner critic says to me. The inner critic is always saying you're a piece of shit or you're a, you're a stupid idiot or whatever. And really challenging that because that whole internally di internal dialogue of who the hell am I is a really powerful part of that goes back to the identity. It goes back to the narrative. It goes back to, you know, um, who am I? What do I want? What and and so that's got to come from an internal place, and um, for sure. Yeah, and Ken, just to kind of jump off of that a little bit, one of the and this is really it's really counterintuitive, but I struggled for a long time with like productivity, and it's still something I'm working on. I wouldn't say I'm exactly where I want to be yet, but I would really beat myself up. I get into like self destructive habits. Like years ago, you know, I'd watch porn, I'd like play video games, and I was just like not doing stuff that I needed to do, um, especially when I'd started a business, right? There was like things that like all sorts of crap was coming to face me. And it was really easy for me to beat myself up because, like, dude, like, like, like get out there and make money, get out there and do things. What actually made a really big shift for me was to stop being such an asshole to myself. And so uh, when, yeah. <laughs> so when something, when I wouldn't, when I would like do something bad, I would like forgive myself mm -hmm. and basically say like, well, you know what? Like, it's like, it's okay. It's okay. Like you're human, you make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like, it wasn't like I was like rationalizing away the behavior. I was very aware of, you know, the negative aspects of it. But because I released that pressure, 
I had like I realized that because you are you like manage yourself, right? So if if you're like a if you're like a bad manager, and a lot of times you know when you don't have somebody like if you have a bad relationship with your father, right? You have that critical voice, as Ken was saying, in your head that's just kind of going after you. Like if you if you yell at someone all the time, like they're on edge and they're looking for escapes, right? So if you actually like chill out a little bit and say, cool, take the day off, relax. And you allow yourself to be bored and just like to be okay, like you're actually gonna start to, to do more things and you're gonna start to feel a little bit better because the truth is everybody here, man, has so many, everybody has their demons, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. I thought we were all perfect masculine red pill men. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, no nope. uh, question on the red pill. This is a community that's supposed to be dedicated to the truth, the truth about men, women, sexual dynamics, uh, you know, all these things, right? Mm -hmm. Why is that community at times seems to not be focused on the truth? And there seems to be an echo chamber, cult like personalities trying to drive the narrative, stopping open debate while speaking out the other side of the mouth that they're all for it. You know, it's an open place. Everybody can contribute unless I say your purple pill or whatever, a blue pill. I mean, you've been called like, the ultimate purple pill shill of all time and shit. Ironically, you're wearing a purple shirt. Purple shirt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that purple. wasn't deliberate? Ooh. Yeah, yeah good. Ooh, good. No, man, that's some deep, that's an NLP shit right there, son. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, I've always been dedicated to truth in my company. And honestly, it's something me and Rolo had a really, even over the years, uh, a lot of back and forth on, is that this never, I never felt, and there's a reason I think it wasn't respected, it's because he was never about the truth. He was about his own message that he was presenting his truth. And, I've, and that's why I wanted to get you on the show today, one of the reasons. And other guests we've had too, like Stefan Molyneux and stuff now, Richard mm -hmm. Brennan. This community, the manuscript itself, should be focused on truth in part, as well as men, masculinity, and fathering these issues. Uh, and then other components too, intersexual dynamics, politics can have a play, you know, men have very deep beliefs about religion, how does that interplay into becoming a man, masculinity, what you believe about the world. So what are your thoughts on that community, that sub-community of the manosphere and its relationship with truth and the focus on truth? And well, veering off from that. Well, I, you know, I think the funny thing is that they talk about truth a lot, but they actually have a very bad relationship with truth mm. Be because, I mean, it's just, you know, they had one view of the world shattered mm. and then they did the exact same thing again with just a different set of specifics, but it's the same sort of, it's very like, you know, people who seek control, right? It's because they lack internal control and, and that, that comes with ideas as well. It's like if you feel completely uncertain about everything in life, you're going to cling on to an ideology. So the idea that like this is the way it is and like you question it, you know, your fucking purple pill, whatever, like that's not a commitment to the truth because the truth is constantly, I mean. And specifically and, too, you're saying you're talking about a person being labeled purple pill, not an idea. And those, yeah, those, those are two separate issues. Yeah. 100, no, 100 percent. Um, as if you have a commitment to the truth, you have a commitment to allowing your ideas to evolve mm -hmm. because there is constantly new things that you're taking in. I mean, I, I like, I'm look, and not, like just said, evolve, not just evolve, but be challenged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, things that I believed years ago are, I no longer, you know, believe it, or at least I don't believe it in the same way. I'm, mm -hmm. I maybe understand it in a certain context differently, mm -hmm. but like it's constantly expanding. I mean, one of the things I'm doing now, and this is going to like, for a lot of guys, it's, it's like, I, I don't know who's going to follow me in the manosphere with it. I don't really care. It's my own journey. But like, I'm get I'm exploring like energy manipulation and whatever. It's really weird esoteric stuff. But this is kind of like, as I keep peeling back layers, I keep finding more and more stuff. And I'm like, well, I'm curious about this. Let me see. How does this work? Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, I don't know where it's going to take me, but my commitment to the truth, at least my truth, is that I'm going to keep exploring and to keep being curious. And I think if you stop being curious, you're fucked. Well, well put. I like the uh, I like the subtlety, the subtlety of it. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, my take on it, in very very brief, is that truth should be a focus on reality itself, as best as we, as we can understand it, using our brains and cognition and emotions and all these things. And yeah, I think there's been there's always been this like very uh, loosey goosey relationship with like everything on the red pill being amoral and a religious and a political and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it almost seems like a reality or a epistemology. Like mm -hmm. there's not, there's not a more 
I've, I've felt since I found it that this community has lacked a more stringent or a strict respect for reason and a commitment to literally rationality mm -hmm. uh, and, and, a and a focus on reality and not more explicit epistemological so theory of knowledge principles on these issues. And in my opinion, that's one of the reasons that separate from the trauma and like you mentioned, the breaking with reality, a former version of it that they thought the blue pill. Yeah, they don't have the it's lacking the philosophic rigor to maintain over time a focus on truth. Yeah, well, and I think that I, I think that one of those things when it comes to that though is that a lot of the people that are having those challenges, number one, and, and I don't mean any disrespect to atheists per se, but they don't have any sense of God, they don't have any sense of family, they don't have close family connections, or they've never had close family connections. They don't and have so a to guide them through life. They have nothing. Correct. So they come up with these ideas on their own, or they come up with them from primarily other YouTubers, and they don't have good, strong mentorship or people willing to challenge their ideas in their personal space. And so what ends up happening is, is that they create these echo chambers and they become more extreme. Hmm. And, and, I, and I think really that's one of the reasons that we have to keep talking, because some people have asked me like, well, like, Pat, why do you even bother, like, talking to these guys? Why do you even bother, like, dealing with this stuff? And it's like, well, because there are a lot of guys out there who don't have, like, Darius, you know, they don't have a father in their life. They have all, they're, they're very susceptible to things. And if you just seed the ground because it's like, I'm above it, it's like, you're not really doing people a, a service. Like, every now and then, at the very least, you have to, like, come back and re-engage and, and kind of give people, at the very least, an alternate perspective that they can choose on their own if they'd like to go down that path. Um, mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how many messages. I get a couple every week from people that are like, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the things that you're saying. I was really caught up in all this negative stuff, like breath of fresh air. And I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of you guys get the same sort of stuff. It's yeah. it's like it's a marketplace of ideas. It's a war of ideas. You see it's the war. ground. It's a war. It's a war, you know? Yeah. I posted a uh, DM I got today, last night on Instagram. I posted it today up on my Twitter. <clears throat> and it was a guy who had been watching like, me invites to find Molly to the convention, those interactions in the Redman group and in the interview I did yesterday, uh, Richard Grannon, the Rolo stuff, how extreme I was. Apparently, he first considered it extreme. I responded to kicking Rolo out of all the stuff. Now he's doubling back on that. He's almost, uh, he's not apologizing, but he's, he's a lot more understanding of why I did what I did and how intense it was and how risky it was. It was what, very risky. What it, what it took to do that. Yeah. And I, I really want the Manosphere to be a place where this, this war of ideas is more open. <clears throat> and more civil, and it's not tightly controlled behind the scenes and manipulated to bizarre uh, well, directions. Yeah, we, we need to not have it be a war of ideas. What we need to have it be is a discussion and an evolution of ideas, because you know only through discussion, agreement, and disagreement are we really going to distill, you know, the nuggets of wisdom from what we all bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And I think that for us, it, it is a discussion. But there's, you know, it's it's one of those things that if there's certain groups that they're just going to, you know, ad hominem you out of there. And, you know, well, you just, they're, at a certain point, you can't, I mean, that's what I learned. Like, people have said that to me before. Like, why don't you go uh, talk, like, well, just like, go, you know, like deal deal with things with Rolo, you know, why don't you guys have a conversation? It's like, dude, I tried doing that. I tried doing that for six months. It doesn't, some people just don't want to have it. Mm -hmm. And it's all right, you know we can have these conversations. This is like, this is awesome. Like this is awesome yeah. and this is productive. And yeah. I think that, I think yeah. that just like, you know, the magnitude of like all of us talking right here, like it speaks, I think it's, it's the vast majority of guys. It's it speaks, it speaks for itself. Like yeah. who, who cares more and who's more aware. Yep. Yeah. I think that cares what drives the civility of discourse and discussion and a lack of civility, including if it's covert and not obvious is what drives this rage and the, and the fight. Where it's a really, it gets to be really nasty. Like what you have with Rolo, mm -hmm. there's reason. There's reasons to turn out like that. You had a much more positive, uh, I think, approach to debate and discussion. That wasn't going to fly with him, in my opinion. And that's why. That's why it played out in real life like it did. Who knows how many times? Dozens, hundreds of times. You guys went back and forth. Yeah, I think everyone who's dealt with him has, has had the same experience. Yeah, I just think that you know when we start talking about it being a war, a war of ideas, man. When I the we're, we're all in the trenches. And this is not just a war. This is a war for lives. I mean, men are committing suicide right and left. It's yep. like uh, when it really comes down to it, you know, how are we empowering men? How are we saving their souls? How are we giving them an identity and then setting them free to be able to be the men that they've been des designed to be? 
and to live powerfully in their world. And, and that's what we want. That's what I want. And, and getting caught up in, you know, these little battles or these little, um, whatever the hell you want to call them. Spats. Uh, it's mm-hmm. spat. It's like, we're losing our energy. Our energy well, needs to go to the real conversation about how to actually become strong men. Yeah. And I think that, that a lot of times though, you'll find, and I, and again, I'm, I'm no stranger to this, you know, cause for a lot of people, I'm the great Satan. Um, <laughs> for clarity, no, I'm, for, but context, <laughs> you, had a major, you had a major fallout about a year ago with turd flinging monkey. Yeah, I had a, I've, I've had a major fallout with Turd Flinging Monkey. I had to deal with some people that were shilling a, a scam to the MGTOW mm-hmm. community. Um, there have been other people that were doxers within the community. I mean, I've had to deal with a lot of things, and I've taken out a lot of trash. And so as a result, there is, you know, there's a lot of people out there that they're like, oh, my God, DDJ is a great Satan. And so I think that, that at the end of the day, the reality is, though, is that it's not so much that these are spats is these are tantrums. You have these people that, that you know, they're these narcissists, these insecure people, these people who, who they're not interested in internal validation. They're not interested in helping the community. They're only interested in their brand by any means necessary. Mm-hmm. And what ends up happening is, is they create these rifts purposefully to be distractions to men who are really trying to do the work. Yep. And you know, I mean, I notice even like I filed this Google lawsuit, I put out a new website, I've got a new Facebook page now, I'm doing some different things. And what's happened is, is that, you know, yeah, there's a new brand of, of, of tantrums coming out. I'm ignoring it because it's a waste of my time. But the point is, is that when it comes to these types of things, I think it's important that, you know, we focus on our mission, we focus on our dialogue, we focus on civil disagreement where we do, and we keep moving forward because regardless, you know, at the end of the day, you know, men don't just walk outside when the sun is shining. I mean, sometimes there's a storm and a blizzard and you got to go out anyway. And that's, mm-hmm. that's our job. So there it is. I can yeah. follow up on what DDJ just said too, that this year for me, well, I think as long as conflicts and conflict resolution are a minority of regular activity and content creation and discussion in any community of men, particularly the manosphere and then the subgroups, that's fine. That's normal. And I think among masculine men, that should be expected. We compete. Mm-hmm. We have conflict. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, internet communication in particular, you know, things that lack facial uh, FaceTime, like literally if there's, no, if there's not Skype or a chat room like this, if it's just Twitter, it's just text. And now that lacks tone, that lacks, uh, there's no, obviously it's not a face-to-face conversation with more empathy and care and responsibility for the words coming out of your mouth. If you say the wrong thing on Twitter, no one's going to punch you in the face because they physically can't. If you say the wrong thing to someone's face in real life, they can get really angry and punch you in the face. Mm-hmm. Um, so as long as it's a minority of what happens, and that's been my experience for 13 years of operating a business and a conference in this space, in this community, uh, 17 now that I've held around the world, five countries, and all the media content creation and internet dialogue that's happened, uh, conflict that, that I've experienced this year is extremely unusual. Uh, by and large, every year, it's just content, 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 message, 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 mm-hmm. mission, 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 mission. So I think inevitably it was going to happen at this scale. And I think that's, that, you know, was inevitable and would have happened sooner or later anyway. And then I think it won't happen again for a long time. Yeah. But given how old I am at 31 and what I'm doing in this space, it'll probably happen again. I don't know when someday, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15, who knows? So that's, those are my thoughts on it. And I do think conflict resolution is important when it's not just some bullshit spat of personalities, mm-hmm. but th- that there's real difficulties, not the difficulties, but, uh, real shady shit, real Machiavellian or malevolent, malevolent behavior specifically. Not even Machiavellian, yeah, but malevolent. Or there's something really wrong going on, and I think that's what was happening to the Manosphere. Mm-hmm. I think that was one of the reasons Mike Cernovich dropped out, and you know, he said the Manosphere was like a digital ghetto. An yeah. internet ghetto. I don't blame him for saying that. Um, he's been, you know, he's been, he's been not a speaker at a conference, but he's attended recently at the Patriarch Edition, and he was actually very surprised and impressed with what he saw. Not just with our event, you know, thanks, but specifically like this community of men gathering. He hadn't seen that before come out of the space. And that's where I want this whole community to go is this positive, healthy discourse uh, where, you know, most of the time it's just positive, good shit. And then sometimes we fight and we work it out. Well, I think, I think any movement in the <clears throat> beginning, it starts off with kind of noticing problems and identifying problems and mm-hmm. bringing more awareness to them. But at a certain stage, you have to propose solutions. Yeah. How dare you? 
and we're well, at that we're at that point now. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah, no, I just yeah. want to talk about theory all day and <laughs> circle jerk the blog post. <laughs> right. Well, just make sure you use European grip. <laughs> what is your? I don't even want. Do I even want to know? What I don't want to know. I don't want to know what that means. <laughs> oh God. Well, well, if it's French grip, it's another dude. So. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> well, guys, we're getting uh, pretty close to the two-hour mark here. Uh, Pat, you know, Ken, you're new to the show. I appreciate you coming on today. Mm -hmm. Pat, you're the special guest in the focus of today. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts, uh, ideas, criticisms of the red pill, your relationship to it with your work? Uh, anything you want to get out? Um, well, I'd say a lot of gratitude because for all the sort of beef I've had, I mm -hmm. wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am without it. Um, okay. You know, honestly, Rolo gave me a lot of attention. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So definitely, <laughs> I, I owe my success to Rolo in a certain certain degree. Um, would have been a little bit longer going. So that's pretty funny. It is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, yeah. No, but I, but I am really appreciative of the space in general. I mean, for all the sort of you know drama and whatnot, made some really good friends from there. Met a lot of really high integrity men, mm -hmm. a lot of really smart men, um, men who you know like you, Anthony, people who are going to be changing the world, like. You know, you're already doing it with 21 convention. Uh, it's 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 a really great place, and I think that we tend to take it for take it for granted. We think this is just a very small place. It's not a big deal. I mean, there's people who have like I'm not even a really I'm not a small account anymore, but I'm not like a big account. And I've had like clients talking to like an Uber driver, and he's talking about you know my work, and people are really familiar with the community. Like there is a really big like it's it's going out. Like it's, it's, it, we, we are the cafe culture of the, of the 21st century mm. and all the ideas that like, like the ideas changed Europe with the enlightenment and whatnot. They start off by people like having coffee and wine and, and drinking in like dark corners of, you know, alleys and whatnot. It's the same stuff that's going on right now. And I think we should all be very proud to be part of it. It's making yeah. history. Absolutely, man. I think it's a masculine renaissance that we're seeing the beginning of uh, as a necessary counterpunch and counterpush to all the effeminate conduct and the effeminiz feminization of the culture that's a depolarization more specifically too. That's caused a lot of problems, a lot of, uh, a lot of unhappiness, a lot of misery, conflict and drama and single motherhood and all this crap, broken families. Mm -hmm. So I well, appreciate having you on, man. This is great. Love to have you back again sometime. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity, Anthony. I appreciate it. Yep. It's great talking with all of you guys, DDJ, yeah. Ken. Absolutely, Pat. It's awesome. Thank you, you guys too. And yep. uh, next time, Steve, don't talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> Steve and chilling. Steve, I'm just chilling. I, I, yep. I, I don't know. I don't know or understand everything he's saying, so I'm just listening. <laughs> listening. Oh, come on now. He's smarter than he. He's smarter than he lets on. A lot smarter. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I I don't I don't recognize what he's saying, so I, I can't talk about something. <laughs> I, don't recognize, so I, just, I just listen. Yeah. All right, guys. So I'm gonna wind down the show. Everybody, thank you for your time today, watching as well as to you know being on the panel. Uh, Ken Curry, Pat Steadman, Steve the Dean Williams, DDJ. Links to all the websites and stuff will be in the description underneath this video. Most of them already are, but I'll update it with more after the show. We'll see you guys next week at 11 a.m. Uh, sharp Eastern time on Saturday, and you can tune in to the Patriarch Show most Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, Thursday night on the Red Man Group channel. See you guys later. Peace out.